Happy Father's Day to everybody. And um, let me uh, also thank Kevin for a great job giving us an update on uh, what the search committee is doing. But I want to uh, uh, confess something. Uh, I snuck in and looked at some notes that the search committee had that uh, they were listing the qualifications. And, and he was honest when he said that one of the qualifications is hair. Okay, so that was honest. What he didn't explain to you is that another qualification that came in second was tall. Okay, and, and then I saw that there was a third qualification that said kind. And then there was a third, a fourth qualification that said that the pastor's wife needs to know how to cook. And then... <laughs> And then there was one last qualification that said the new pastor should not try to tell jokes. <laughs> All right. So that's that. Happy Father's Day. Take your Bibles and join me in the book of Hebrews. We've been going through the book of Matthew, but we're going to be in Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews chapter number 11. And I decided because it's Father's Day to go ahead and... Uh, speak to fathers and speak to those who have fathers, I guess all of us, and to just kind of talk that through a little bit. Uh, you can't help but get up here and when you start talking about fathers, think about your own father. And uh, I remember that, uh, you know, and I think we all go through this, my dad had different names for me. And uh, most of the time he called me Kenny, and then uh, uh, sometimes he called me Kenneth. And I, I didn't, did not want to hear the name Kenneth. Uh, that, that was not the, the best name to hear. In fact, uh, I remember specifically, uh, and uh, I was just, I wasn't very old, and we were living in a wonderful neighborhood and where all the kids played together and we were in and out of each other's homes. And, and so I went into the neighbor's house next door, and there was a $5 bill laying there on a table and uh, I stole it. Uh, so I took $5, and then I rounded up all the kids in the neighborhood, and we had a drugstore on the corner. So I told the kids, I said, hey, uh, come with me. I'm going to treat all of us. So I took the $5, and I took them all to the neighborhood drugstore, and I, uh, I, I, I again, you know, I'm, uh, you caught on how intelligent I am, right? So anyway, we got to the drugstore, and I bought all of these kids uh, a new toothbrush. Not, not candy, no, no, toothbrushes. Okay, so then we came back from the drugstore, marching down the street. You know, I'm kind of like the Pied Piper now because I've treated all the kids to a new toothbrush, and they're following me. We're going down the street, and as we're going down the street, all the other parents are out of their homes, and they're greeting this parade, and they're greeting me, and... Uh, uh, and as I got closer and closer, my dad said, Kenneth, <laughs> you got it, Kenneth. So uh, don't call me Kenneth, okay? And all God's people said, oh, I thought you were going to say Kenneth. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Father's Day. All right, we're in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter number 11, and uh, let's just... Uh, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read verses uh, 30 through the rest of the chapter in chapter 11. Then we're going to pray and ask God to help us unpack a few more verses in chapter number 12. And uh, before we do that, let me just mention that uh, I think we would all agree that when we hear a young man uh, say, you know, I just want to be just like my dad. Isn't that cool? There's nothing better than that. I just want to be like my dad. Or when a young girl or another child would say, I just want to be like my mom. And, uh, uh, and today what I'd love to do is, uh, in a topical fashion instead of expositionally, uh, I'd like to challenge all of us to remember that the definition of a godly dad is a disciple. You know, a disciple has two roles. A disciple has the role of teaching, 
and the disciple has a role of demonstrating, teaching, and also saying, model your life after me. A godly dad wakes up every day thinking to himself, God has given me the call to be a disciple of my children. And to be a disciple means I'm going to tell them things, I'm going to teach them things, but more importantly, I want them to watch my life. I want to be a disciple, discipler. Uh, I want, you know, we talk a lot about role models today, and wow, we, it's so scary because, uh, you know, if we look at the media today, we see role models that maybe just come out of uh, sports, or we find role models that come out of entertainment, role models that maybe come out of music, maybe role models that come out of uh, businessmen that are extremely wealthy and successful. And role models, a role model is a dad. That's what the Lord has called us to. And so in a minute, what we're going to do is, I think the Lord has made it very clear to us that this, re this responsibility of uh, uh, going out into the world is a discipling responsibility, and it begins at home with our children. And it begins by saying, I want you, in fact, wouldn't you agree with me that it's a, uh, it's a common saying, but it's not true. Somebody will say once in a while, uh, uh, I want you to do what I say, uh, but I don't want you to do what I do. That's a shame. That's not right. Uh, what we ought to be doing is saying, uh, I want you to both do what I say, and I want you to do what I do. I want you to watch my life. I want you to model yourself after me. Uh, how you doing so far? How does it feel, dads? How does it feel to me when I think about the fact that God has blessed me with children to teach? He's blessed me with grandchildren. He's blessed me with great-grandchildren. And my, my responsibility is not only to teach, but my responsibility is to say, hey, uh, I, I want you to do what I do. I, I want you to model your life off of me. That's a heavier responsibility, isn't it? And so we're going to be looking at that in just a moment. But let's begin here, and you follow along in your Bible. Uh, just listen as I read, at, beginning at verse 30 in chapter number 11. By faith... The walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. In fact, chapter 11 of Hebrews is the great hall of fame of faith, people of faith. We go on and read, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony uh, through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided some, something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, as we embark now in a minute on chapter 12, and beginning with verse number 1, I would pray that what we cannot understand on our own, that your Holy Spirit would teach us, that you would give us ears to hear, hearts that could be changed. And Lord, our number one goal is that uh, 
we would have come to church this morning in order to hear from you, Lord, and that we would leave realizing that we have a wonderful Father in heaven. We have a Father who loves us with an unbelievable love, a love that says, I love you so much, you can't keep me from loving you. I have decided to love you. A love that is a, uh, a representation of the, the Father's love for each one of us as fathers. And so, God, I pray that you would help me now. Help me to think, help me to communicate, and Lord, most of all, help me to get out of the way so that people would see you in it. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's begin at verse number one of chapter 12. Very familiar passage, a wonderful passage. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If you're like me and you think visually, uh, I can see all of these people here that the writer is referring to, this crowd of people, this, all of these witnesses here. And the witnesses would mean all of these people that have gone on before us, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all of these that have gone on before us, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul, we could keep on going. All of these that have gone on before us, there are a witness to us of their faith and their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says that you and I, uh, if we'll just kind of close our eyes and, and think about it, we are right now, not in a literal sense, but in a very, very real sense, they are witnessing to us right now uh, the fact that they were people just like you and me. Some of them were bald. Some of them were short. Uh, they were just like you and me. And what they did is they were called upon in the same way that we are. They were called upon to allow God, who they trusted, they were called upon to trust Him more. They were called upon to walk by faith. They were called upon to allow themselves to go through hard experiencing experiences, knowing that hard was good for them, because everything hard that God would bring into their life would further develop their faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, we need to just every day remind ourselves of the importance of faith. Uh, we're a, a people who don't like to walk by faith. We're a people that like to test something. We're a people that like to take a step and then stop and look around and say, well, that didn't work very good, so let me back up. Instead of taking a step and saying, I can take this step with boldness because I know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and my God has told me this, and so I can walk confidently, and I don't have to depend upon how I feel. I don't have to depend upon how hard it is, because if it is hard, I realize the fact that this is God's will in order to grow my faith. Count it all joy when we fall into different trials and temptations, knowing this, that the trial of our faith worketh patience. And let it continue, that God might be able to continue the work He's doing in our life. And so here we have this great cloud of witnesses. Now dads and those that are soon to be dads, uh, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, uh, I, I want to give you a, a, a piece of practical advice. I think one of the greatest things you can do for your kids, that I can do for kids, is to be able to remind them of the cloud of witnesses. Uh, I, I think that all of our kids need to know the life of Abraham, don't they? They need to know the life of Jeremiah, of Isaiah. They need to know the life of David. 
They need to know the life of Moses. God didn't put those personalities in the Word of God for no purpose. He put them in there as an example that we might realize that He's giving us a cloud of witnesses, a a huge group of witnesses that can challenge us on because what happens is we can go through something in our own life and we can stop and say, man, oh man, this feels hard. And then boom, like that we remember, oh, I'm not the first one to go through this. Oh, in fact, I remember in the Word of God. This is the same thing. What, What can I learn from this particular witness? What can I learn there? Do you know that uh, for many, many years, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs was a leather-bound book that had a chain on it, and the chain attached it to the podium or the lectern in every evangelical, godly, Bible-preaching church. So you would come into a church, and you would find Fox's Book of Martyrs chained there, and you would also find a church Bible chain there. And they were strong statements to the church every time the people assembled that they should never forget the cloud of witnesses that went on before them that were persecuted, became martyrs because of their faith and their stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us should know this. Every one of us should hide this in our hearts and and read the life of these people, these people that gave their lives for the gospel message, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's been updated recently, and it was, uh, uh, there were over uh, 160,000 Christians martyred in just 2001 alone. Isn't that something? Not of some disease. I guess the disease was the fact that they were in love with Jesus. The disease was that they were willing to die for the love of the gospel. So I think that we ought to teach our our kids things like this. Uh, I was looking at my own library at home, and I was enjoying the fact that I have this whole huge section of books that are biographies wonderful biographies that are part of the cloud of witnesses to my heart. I love to read about Wycliffe, and I love to read about Calvin, and I love to read about Moody, and and I love to read about uh, Charles Hayden Spurgeon, and and those are guys that uh, have been in the ministry and have faithfully served. Today, probably every one of us ought to have a subscription to Voice of the Martyrs. And once in a while, what we ought to do is sit down with our kids, and we ought to just pick somebody out and say, here we go, undercover ministry. Burmese Bibles were distributed to Christians in some of the most hostile areas of Burma. And it goes on to tell the lives of people that are in prison right now, people that have lost their lives, people that are serving the Lord Jesus Christ around the globe. You can get this in your home every single month the voice of the martyrs. Now, again, I, uh, I w- was tempted to bring a lot of other books, and, and I had so many, I thought, this is going to look silly, so I just, so I don't scare you. you. You know, you can also get little paperbacks. Here's Hudson Taylor, the autobiography of a man who brought the gospel to China. Uh, you read this little book, it'll change your life. A cloud of witnesses. Here's a little book, George Mueller, He Dared to Trust God for the Needs of Countless Orphans. Wow. George Mueller, when you study his life, God gave him a burden to care for orphans. And he decided early on <clears throat> that he would not ask ever for any money. He would never ask for food. He would never ask, for, ask anybody for any help, but he would ask God. And so he led these wonderful orphanages for many, many, many years just by getting on his knees and saying, the way that I pray is I lay my Bible on a chair, I get on my knees, and I read until I find a promise, and I pray that promise back to God. And he led uh, uh, orphanages and always had enough food and bread and whatever was needed in order to take care of thousands of orphans without asking any person for a dime, a cloud of witnesses. 
The Word of God is saying here in this passage, therefore we also, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Wait, I wonder sometimes when we look at that, you know, it's going to go on and say, and any sin that's enslaving us, and we probably take that major leap when we think of sin, well, I haven't robbed a bank, or I haven't done this, I haven't hurt anybody, I, you know, haven't cheated on my taxes. But, but the, the, the big weight, the, the one that we need to get rid of is this weight that says that every time, every time something's hard in my life, I rebel. Instead of immediately thinking, no, I'm a believer. And and when things are hard, I rejoice, count it all joy, because I know what God is doing. He is stretching my faith. He is developing my faith. That's how much he loves me. And God's people said, could you do that today? You're going through something hard right now. And instead of just praying, God, take it away. I I want a life of ease. I I don't want anything hard. Can can you make a switch today and just say, Lord, I'm going to trust you because you love me. And what you're committed to is what you have begun in my life. You're going to complete if I'll just let you. I'll just let you do that. So he says here, therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, that lack of trust in the sin which so easily ensnares all of us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. A lot of people in our church are excited about running. Short runs, long runs, marathons, running. We know what in our we, I guess I shouldn't include me. I don't do a lot of running, okay? Uh, uh, I do a lot of eating. And so anyway, uh, uh, but endurance, endurance. And endurance comes with pain. Endurance comes with hard. Endurance. And what he's saying here is that what we need to do is we need to lay aside this temptation to say, well, why is God doing this? What do you mean, why is God? Everything that God is doing in your life is because he loves you. Lay aside the, this snare and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So what I've done is I've outlined my little message this morning with three points. And I just preached the first one. And the first one is that... Uh, when we think about role models, I think the best role models all of us should have and our kids should have would be to understand the cloud of witnesses. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Apostle Paul, Timothy. Men like uh, Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot, who while he was still a student at Wheaton College, in Wheaton, Illinois, he and some of his buddies decided that God was laying it on their hearts to take the gospel to the Aka Indians. And they did. They were faithful. Was it hard? You bet it was hard. How hard was it? All of them died. Every one of them were hit with a spear. Every one of them left a widow behind. Widows that went on and gave testimony of their husbands and their faith. These men who, young college grads, who just said, we'll do what's hard, and by faith we'll walk this way, we'll be just like what we read about in in Hebrews chapter number 11. And in the process of that, missions, right after their death, missions in America exploded like it had never exploded before. Because a few men said, we'll do what's hard because God loves us. Wow. Those of you that are here and 
your runners and you are all excited about running and, and uh, getting better and faster and running, well, you need to read about Eric Little. You need to be, read about his, uh, his life and, and his uh, dedication to the Lord and, and his opportunity to run for his country and, and the decisions that he made because God came first. Uh, the wonderful music track, Chariots of Fire, comes out of his life. The movie, Chariots of Fire, has to do with his life. Every young person in our church needs to be familiar with the biography, the life, the cloud, the part of the cloud of witnesses in the name of Eric Little. Wow. Well, let's go on here. And then secondly, so my first point is, uh, when we look at role models, it, the role models are this whole big cloud of witnesses, not just one, but a multitude. And then, of course, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So my second point this morning is the best role model, well, can you think of a better role model than the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. We need to hang on his every word. We need to come to this book and hang on every word that comes from Christ, but also he's a role model. Let's look at his life of love. Look at his life of surrender and look at his life of focus on the purpose of the gospel. He gave his life for the gospel that you and I might know God. For the joy set before him, you've heard me say this before, that when Christ went to the cross, he thought visually also. And when he went to the cross, he had a vision of Macy placing her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the future living eternally with him for the joy set before him. When he went to the cross, he saw Luke. In his, Luke hadn't even been born yet, and he saw Luke. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He did that for the joy set before him. What a witness to us. What a role model for us, you and I. Are we willing to give our lives? Jesus did. Are we willing to give our lives, our dreams, our personal aspirations? Are we willing to give our life for the gospel? that one more person might place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So point number one, there's this great cloud of witnesses. Point number two, there's no better role model in the world than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then my last point, and we'll wrap it up with this, is that um, uh, our Heavenly Father is the role, greatest role model ever. Our Father, which art in heaven, that Brad had us recite together. Our Father. Look at our Father beginning in verse 3, or, or beginning here in verse number uh, 4. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten uh, uh, the exhortation which speaks to you as to underline this in your Bible, sons. Sons, sons, do you know of all the world religions, we're the only ones that can refer to God as our Father and know that he refers to us as a son? What, what an honor. And it starts by saying here, my son, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every 
every son whom he receives. I don't think there's anything quite as discouraging to me as when I am in a home visiting a family and uh, uh, the mother will discipline a child and then the dad will step in and say, no, 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 come here, daddy loves you. I wilt, I just wilt. Uh, where, where did we get this idea that discipline is not love? I mean, God is the great example. God, our Father, is the great disciplinarian. He's the great trainer. He's the great one who says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you holier and holier and holier and develop you and do much more in your life if you'll let me take you through hard things and in the process of this, you will trust me. You'll grow in faith. Discipline. When the Lord loves, he disciplines. As we go on and read further here, it becomes very, very strong. In fact, uh, uh, if you right now examine your own life and you say, I don't sense that God's disciplining me. I don't sense that he's training me. I don't sense that he's allowing something hard in my life to develop my faith. Uh, I, I don't sense that there's any real difficult exercise and training going on in my life. If, if that's what, what you're thinking right now, you're not one of his. It doesn't get any more stark than that. If you're not being disciplined, going through something hard, being stretched in your faith, you're not a believer. You're not a son. You're not born again. You might be religious, but you're not one of his. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Wow. Sometimes, because I'm so, I'm such a nice guy. There you go again. I should not be telling jokes. All right, because I'm such a nice guy. I, I feel like sometimes I am going to explode when I'm in a grocery store or other, some other store where there's a checkout line and Johnny has decided to take charge. And mom is demonstrating to all of the people watching how much she loves Johnny. And all the people watching are thinking, boy, does Johnny ever need some loving discipline. And I'm going to put my hands in my pocket right now because I'm not going to jail. Wow. You see, this thing of discipline, it's not up for debate. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Uh, he's, he's teaching us here how to be good dads and how to be good moms. He's teaching us how to deal with our children. Uh, let me read it a little bit more. It's so self-explanatory. Verse 7, if you endure ch chastening, or discipline, or training, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? I'll answer that question. That son is a neglected son. That son doesn't have a dad. That son has a buddy. That son has a pal. But that son doesn't have a dad. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, and you're not even sons. 
Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. You know, we all kid about, we hear that statement, son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And the little boy thinks, oh yeah, I don't believe that for a minute. I do believe that for a minute, for more than a minute. Because I believe I can still hear my dad after he disciplined me in the next room weeping for his son. I believe it. It hurts to discipline. It hurts to challenge. It hurts to allow our, watch our kids go through hard things. It hurts. Don't buy the world's message that now what we're going to do is we're going to be really, really great parents and we're going to make sure that our kids never, ever, ever have any pain. We're going to make sure our kids never go through anything hard. We are going to make sure that they're given everything that they want. Wow. And if you're right now struggling with what I'm saying, I I just want you again to just go to the Word of God. This is not my words. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. He allows to go through hard things. Well, verse 10, For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but He for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been hurt by it, brutally beat up by it, no, trained by it. We're not talking here about beating up children. We're talking about loving discipline. We're talking about training, disciplining, and allowing kids to go through hard stuff. Hard stuff. Another little caveat of this, guys, is as parents, don't make the mistake of uh, of trying to insulate your kids from everything hard in your life. Because, you see, you're the role model. When you're going through something hard and they see what you do when you're going through something hard, what are they doing? They are learning. They are growing. They are being parented. Just like God does in our life. Don't say, well, we're always going to talk about this in secret and not let our kids know what's going on. How are they ever going to learn how to cry before the Lord? How are they ever going to learn how to walk by faith themselves? When you say, well, I'm teaching, I'm teaching. I'm No, teaching goes beyond just words of teaching. The, the Lord went beyond that. He says, I've given you a whole book. It's a book of teaching. But now I want you to know this, that I love you so much that I'm also going to train you. I'm going to train you because I love you. Train you. Dads, what a wonderful privilege we have. Oh, man, don't minimize it at all. We're dads. We're fathers. And we have these wonderful examples. And we have these little lives that we can disciple And we can do everything we can to pour our lives into them. And there's no greater thrill 
in all the world than for a dad to overhear their child say, when I grow up, I want to be just like my dad. I want to be just like my mom. Wow. Get your root beer. There's lots of it. 